Move and Connect web <laughs> webinar series. We are going to be recording this. So if you need to change any of your settings, including your name, uh, you're welcome to. This recording will be uh, linkable on our website afterwards and will be sent to you by email afterwards as well. Uh, I'm Sarah Lucina. I'm going to be your moderator today, and I'm wearing my uh, executive director of the Active Aging Society hat uh, uh, in, in my moderation of this call today. I am also a mother, a granddaughter, and an uninvited settler uh, with a passion of promoting the health of people and planet. I invite all of you to bring your whole selves uh, into the webinar today and to think expansively about the information that's shared here today, how it impacts you, how it impacts your personal health, and how it impacts the health of you, the communities that you're a part of. Before we launch into the official opening, I did just want to go over a couple of housekeeping uh, details. I know many people on the call may not be familiar with Zoom. Uh, if you can hear me, congratulations, you've arrived. If you have any technical uh, difficulties, you can uh, have a chat with uh, Ariel and, and uh, using the chat function, which is at the middle of uh, the bottom of your screen. You can hover over the chat uh, or the bar at the bottom and you should be able to find the chat function. Uh, we've received lots of questions uh, uh, through the registration page um, and I will address many of those in our Q&A. Um, if you have additional questions throughout the webinar, please pop them up in the chat. You can address them to me, Sarah Lucina, the moderator, uh, and I'll bring them into the Q&A as we have time. Um, the Move and Connect webinar uh, series uh, was, was initiated out of our desire to provide a platform where older adults um, in BC and beyond uh, could be supported in their physical and social health. Uh, including our over 6,500 Choose to Move participants. Uh, we wanted a place where we could come together uh, to share some of the best ways to keep physically active and socially connected. These webinars are geared uh, to that audience, to the older adults in BC. So feel free to drop us a line uh, over the next couple of months if there's a topic that you're interested in. Um, the scientific evidence is resounding. For every age, sitting less and moving more and being social are some of the best ways to keep healthy. If you want to learn more, please uh, have a look at choosetomove.ca, the Active Aging Society's signature program. I want, to, I want to acknowledge our over 90 Choose to Move delivery partners, many are, of whom are on the call today. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that the services that you provide to seniors are critical and we are inspired by your unwavering commitment to keep older adults in your communities active and connected, especially over these challenging 20 months of the pandemic. It is our intention that the Choose to Move webinars will also be a service to you as well in your vital work. I want to acknowledge our funders, the BC Ministry of Health, as well as the Federal New Horizons for Seniors program. This support enables us to foster and scale networked and evidence-based uh, action to support seniors' health. Of course, I must acknowledge our founders and our key collaborators at the Active Aging Research Team at UBC. Our research and the Active Aging Society are founded and led by Drs. Heather McKay and Dr. Joni Student-Schooled. Their vision and efforts to innovate and evaluate Choose to Move and other health promotion initiatives for older adults um, provide us with effective, implementable, and scalable solutions for seniors' health. As a step towards reconciliation, I also want to acknowledge that I'm joining you from um, the unceded and ancestral lands of the Coast Salish people, and specifically the nation of the Tsleil-Waututh. I invite all on the call who would like to place in the chat the lands that you are joining from to do so. You can learn more about the traditional territories of the Indigenous people globally. Um, and that's, that link uh, to, to um, uh, the map uh, should be coming up in the chat right now. I also invite you to learn more about the 20, uh, 94 calls to action put forth by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The website and access to the report will also be placed in the chat. Please consider ways that you can in your personal and professional lives uh, meaningfully and boldly support work towards these calls. Indigenous communities have a profound reverence for their elders and nature. There is much that we can learn from their approach and their wisdom. Respecting knowledge and knowledge keepers of the past and present, 
and considering the health and prosperity of future generations in all ecologies in every decision. For decades, we have heard warnings of climate change. If you're calling from BC, you will have experienced many troubling events over the past five months. The heat dome, the tornado, floods and landslides. Our thoughts are with all of those who have suffered in these events. We know that these climate events do not impact all communities and populations equally. Among many vulnerable groups, we know the health and well being of older adults are at disproportionate risk. And so forms the focus of our webinar today a prescription for nature. I am beyond thrilled that Dr. Melissa Lam and Anna Cooper Reed accepted my invitation to speak uh, at, at, to our network and to tailor the benefits of their product projects for our audience of older adults and the organizations that serve them. Thank you so much for being here and for your critical work. I know that you are both in high demand, especially in the wake of current events. I will say just a few things about these exceptional leaders and then invite them uh, to share other ways that they would like to introduce themselves as they kick off their presentations. Dr. Melissa Lem is a Vancouver-based family doctor. She's a president-elect at the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment and the founder of the Prescription for Nature program at the BC Parks Foundation. She's an on-air medical expert and writer for the C CBC and CTV and a clinical assistant professor at UBC's Faculty of Medicine. Anna Cooper-Reed is a social worker uh, with experience working with older adults in community and long-term care settings. She's currently pursuing a PhD at the Institute of Health Policy and Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto, and is the president and founder of the Emerging Leaders for Environmental Sustainability and Healthcare with the Center for Sustainable Health Systems. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Lem uh, to, to, to kick us off. Sorry, I was having a little brief technical difficulty there. Thank you so much, um, Sarah, for the setting the stage and the introduction and the client and uh, just you know your words acknowledging what we're going through right now. Um, I just want to start off by saying that I am speaking from the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil territories, and I want to point everyone's attention um, to what's going on in the north part of our province right now with the Wet'suwet'en uh, Nation, who are currently um, having to deal with incursions from colonial peoples on their territory as they try to continue to connect themselves to nature and also <laughs> prevent their traditional territories from being harmed um, by development of the fossil fuel industry. Anyway, as you'll see um, through this presentation, yeah, it's you know so important I'm... for people at every age and oh. people from every territory and background to be able to connect to nature safely um, and also effectively and in a deep way um, during, during their everyday lives. And it's important that we continue our work, not only with the BC Parks Foundation, but as a larger whole to enable a wide variety of people, everyone in this province to be able to do so. So as Sarah mentioned, I am the director of park prescriptions for the BC Parks Foundation. And I have a, I've had such, such a privilege over the last year, um, starting in November, 2020, when we, when we kicked off uh, this initiative in launching across the country. So we started off launching in BC in November, 2020, um, and then in Ontario and Saskatchewan and Manitoba, which is where Anna is um, joining me from today. And anyway, just so grateful to see the momentum of our um, initiative and how, how much has been taken up. Uh, by people across this country. So I want everyone to start off just by thinking, just to think in one word, how you feel when you're outside in nature. And you can feel free to think it to yourself. You can put it into the chat. Um, and just, yeah, I'm just curious to see what intuitive sense you get when you're out in nature. I can just imagine what people are thinking. <laughs> Connected, shall we just say. Peace and part of something bigger. Relaxed and release. You can feel free to keep putting those words in there. And this is just one of the many word clouds that we created from what people um, responded to that question in one of in 
probably over 20 presentations, probably close to 25 or 30 that we've done over the past year about this program. And as you can see, many of the words that people are bringing up are words that resonate with other people. And as Sarah mentioned, it's not just this intuitive sense that we get when we're outside in nature that it's good for us. There's also a lot of research to back that up. So these are just two infographics that I've been given permission to share, one on the left from the Canadian Mental Health Association, the one on the right from a group in the US. And as you can see across the lifespan, connecting to nature and spending time in nature is incredibly good for us. So for example, it's been shown to increase bone density, enhance your immune system function, reduce anxiety and depression, reduce symptoms of ADHD in kids, reduce pain responses after surgery in hospitals, improve work satisfaction. There are just an incredible number of health benefits, both mental and physical, to spending time in nature. And we're going to talk about some of those today and, and, and just the added benefits um, from a, a climate and environmental standpoint of, of connecting to nature. So we can think of nature prescriptions as a subset of social prescribing. And the reason why it's so important for us as healthcare professionals to, to connect patients to um, resources in their, in their environment is because what we do in healthcare is really only responsible for about 25% or 20% of health outcomes. So, you know, I'm a physician um, and as a social worker, we have many nurses, physiotherapists, psychologists connected with our program. And we like to think what we do is important and it is, but really it's the 75% of things outside of our healthcare system that have the most impact on people's health. And so if you look at that kind of middle column of words, you can probably imagine that connecting to nature and spending time in nature could positively impact many of those different factors. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about um, the, the added benefits of connecting to nature over and beyond just kind of the, the individual health benefits. So as, a, as someone trained in human biology and as, as a physician, I always think, okay, like what's the biological basis behind this? Like, why is nature so good for us? And um, this, this is a part of a webinar or, or part of a series of webinars that have to do with active aging. And a lot of people often ask, is it the exercise? That's actually not the only thing. So there are two theories behind why nature is so good for our brains. The first one is called attention restoration theory. And when you think about it, when you spend time in nature, uh, when you spend time in cities, they're really busy. They're full of lights, full of traffic, um, full of people and obstacles that you have to navigate around and lots of hard edges. And what this does is it forces us to constantly have to direct our attention um, to, to nav navigate around these obstacles. And that tires out our brains, it increases fatigue and increases irritability. Whereas when you spend time in nature, it's a source of soft fascination. So it's interesting, but you don't have to constantly direct your attention over and over again to get around things. And so what this does is it restores our powers of attention. It reduces our irritability and fatigue. And the second theory as to why nature is so good for our brains is called stress reduction theory. So the theory says that when you have when there's a stressful episode or a stressful time in your life spending time in nature helps your brain recover faster than in built environments and this speaks to how our brains evolved in nature so when you think about it when you spend time in highly biodiverse areas it really has everything that we need to survive so it has sources of water it has food sources heights that you can climb up to look out to look for predators and look to where your community would be, be moving next so really early brains that evolved to love to spend time in nature survived longer and passed those nature loving genes on to future generations. So loving nature, feeling more comfortable in nature is really hardwired into our brains from an evolutionary standpoint. So I want to talk a bit about some of the amazing research behind the health benefits of nature. So I'm just going to share some of my favorite studies. So this one was a study in Toronto um, that combined high resolution satellite imagery, individual tree data, Ontario health study data, and self reports of health perception. And after controlling for a number of different factors, what they found was that 10 more trees per block actually improved people's health perception, similar to an increase in their personal income of $10,000 per year, moving to a neighborhood with $10,000 per year, higher median median income or being seven years younger. So as many of us in healthcare know, income and age are two major determinants of health. So I thought it was really neat how this um, study compared was something really easily measurable, such as tree cover to, to income and age. And I think, you know, once we all get past a certain age, we're, we remember how we probably felt a bit better seven to 10 years ago. So anyway, I thought this was a neat, uh, this was a neat study. And it's also Canadian. I like this study because it speaks to how nature can be viewed as medicine in a very specific sense. So this was a study with kids in Chicago and they took 17 children with ADHD on three 20 minute walks through a city park, through a downtown area and through a residential area. 
And what they found was that the 20 minute walk in the park actually improved their digit span backwards performance, similar to levels in kids without ADHD. And so you can see on the graph on the right hand side here, this um, vertical bar. So as you can see the walk in the park, even though they got the same amount of activity as someone walking in the neighborhood or downtown actually improved this, this score significantly more. So just quickly, the DSB score, you recite a number of numbers in a row, and then um, the person will rep recite those numbers back to you as many as they can remember. And so the higher number of numbers you can recite tells, tells you that you're better, uh, your, your attention and your memory is better with this kind of math task. And anyway, when they crunched the numbers, they found that the benefit was similar to the peak effects of Ritalin or a prescription stimulant medication on um, the uh, participants. So no one is saying that spending time in nature is going to replace all the effects of prescription medication, but I think it really speaks to how powerful nature can be as an adjunct for people at every stage of life to improve their attention and improve their mental health. So I just want you to think of, again, uh, I'm trying to make this presentation a little bit interactive um, about, about the science. So we do have some specific recommendations in our program about how much time people, people should be spending in nature for the best benefits. So I'm wondering if you can put in the chat what you, so what amount of time you think people report significantly better health and well-being after spending that certain amount of time in nature per week? Is it one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, or five hours? And I don't, saying. we can't be interactive because yeah, not everybody can send a note to everybody else. So okay, maybe you can just uh, do the spoiler and, and tell sure, us. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, people are, um, are saying one hour, three hours, four hours. And you know what's funny is the actual answer is two hours. So, and there's evidence behind that. So this was a study that came out in 2019 and it was a study of almost 20,000 adults in England. And what they found was that their likelihood of reporting good health or high well-being was significantly greater when their nature contact was more than or equal to two hours per week. And this was again, after controlling for a number of other factors that would determine health. And they found that those positive associations continued um, and until they hit about 200 to 300 minutes per week. And so we don't say, you know, cut your nature time off at two hours. If you've hit two hours, you'll continue to get those benefits. But two hours is kind of that minimum that we're looking for um, when it comes to health and well-being. So the next question is, what's the most efficient drop in cortisol levels? When does it happen? I'll skip over this interactive part. Um, and again, this is something that informs um, the recommendations in our program to spend at least 20 minutes in nature each time. So this study looked at 36 urban dwellers over about two months, and they asked them to have a nature experience in an outdoor place that brought them a sense of contact with nature at least three times per week and for 10 minutes or more. And what they found was that their cortisol or stress hormone levels dropped over 20% more after a nature experience compared to a non-nature experience. And if you look again at this graph on the right-hand side, you can see that third little red line there is between the 20 and 30 minute mark. And that's where that stress dropped the most rapidly. So a lot of us are busy with, with multiple um, obligations in our lives. So if you want to think about how to get the biggest bang for your buck in terms of nature time, spend it between that 20 and 30 minute mark. And of course, more is always better because as you can see, the cortisol continues to drop. But if you only have a little time, aim for 20 minutes. And a lot of people, you know, wonder why would the BC Parks Foundation, which is a, like a parks organization, really focusing on health when it comes to trying to motivate people to get outside? And the answer is right there. The answer is because health is such an effective message for getting people to change their behaviors. So we can take some of some of this, um, our lessons behind the health message from the research behind climate change. And this was, uh, I'm just gonna present a study that was done where they surveyed over 7,500 participants in five countries uh, across the world. And they, they read participants um, five pairs of statements and asked them which would make them more likely to support policies tackling climate change. So they had a statement that was centered around the economy uh, paired with one with health or a statement around the environment paired with the economy. And what they found was that when they framed kind of the need to act based on health and environmental framing, 
this actually increased people's uh, support for the policy recommendations. And in fact, economic framing had no effect on the everyday person. Um, something else interesting was when they framed the opportunity for, for changes um, and, and, and benefits in terms of opportunities versus in terms of this nasty thing will happen if you don't, if you don't change, um, they actually found the opportunity framing increased people's support for the policy suggestion. And also focusing on what's happening to people now in um, the present impacts are also more motivating than future impacts to make a change. And that's exactly what we try to do in our nature prescription program. We talk to people about the benefits that they're going to have now in terms of their health. Um, and, and really this is, this is based in science in terms of um, motivating more people to change their behaviors and, and connect to nature. So some more information about why connecting to nature is, is good for the planet. So healthcare is in fact a major contributor to global carbon dioxide emissions. So anything that improves people's health status like connecting to nature is going to reduce the burden on the healthcare system and reduce our overall carbon pollution. Um, if, if global healthcare were a country, it would actually be the fifth highest emitter in the world. And within Canada, about uh, almost 5% of our emissions can, come from our healthcare system, which is actually the same as um, of the airline industry, which is significant. So anyway, I think it's pretty important for us to focus on what we can do within our, our healthcare system, and this is one of them. Also, increasing urban nature and natural ecosystems makes our cities healthier. So not only does connecting people to nature make people healthier, but also increasing green infrastructure, increasing, um, increasing tree cover will reduce that urban heat island effect, which I'll talk a bit more about later, that makes people sicker when they're exposed to climate effects. Um, also having more green surfaces versus hard built surfaces um, improves water absorption when heavy rainfalls and flooding happen. So, so, based, so increasing um, natural infrastructure again is going to make us healthier and also our cities as a whole healthier. Also across the lifespan, people who are more connected to nature are more likely to not only protect it, but also to engage in other pro-environmental behaviors. So the research says that, um, that when you're more connected to nature, not only will you protect what you love, but also your pro-environmental behaviors will extend to, for example, um, saving electricity, uh, in increasing recycling, advocating on a political level um, for actions that will fight climate change. So I like to think every time that I or one of my over a thousand colleagues across the country who are registered, right in nature prescription, um, that we're really doing our bit for the environment as a result. Also, Inger Anderson, the executive director of the UN Environment Program has said that nature is one of the most effective ways of combating climate change and should be part of every country's climate strategy. So if we fully embrace nature-based solutions for climate change that focus on restoring and expanding and enhancing um, our natural ecosystems to deal with both environmental and climate and human issues that this could get us over a third of the way towards our Paris Agreement targets. Currently, there's far, far less than 30% of the world's um, climate finance invested in nature-based solutions for climate change. So I think given how strong our health voice is, if we get behind, if we, if we encourage our leaders to invest in these nature-based solutions for climate change, we can hopefully close that huge gap between current investments and the potential for carbon reduction. All right, so I just wanna want to um, speak about the recent heat dome that we saw in June and July that as we know, um, led to premature deaths of almost 600 people, which is essentially the biggest um, weather related disaster in, in Canadian history. And so if you look at this map, um, you can see what the land surface, surface temperatures are on a hot summer day. And you can see kind of in this, this area here and kind of like the middle to upper right is the, is the downtown east side. And that not surprisingly is the area in the city which has not only some of the least tree cover um, in kind of the greater Vancouver area, but also we saw over 70% of uh, hospitalizations um, coming from the downtown east side during the heat dome. So really having access to tree cover, having access to green spaces and nature is an equity issue because people who are already marginalized and who already are experiencing the brunt of climate change will experience it even more if we don't increase nature in our, in our environments in an equitable way across the city. And that's something that we really encourage through my work with the, with the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment and, the, and also park prescriptions is just making sure that we reduce those barriers to nature access and make our cities um, healthier by increasing nature in them. So some of the urban, uh, some of the benefits of urban greeting, 
uh, include reducing, reducing the need for air conditioning because of shade, and um, this lowers energy demand because of reduced air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. Trees also remove air pollutants and sequester carbon dioxide. As I mentioned, um, green infrastructure reduces stormwater runoff and improves water quality by absorbing and filtering rainwater. And also the numbers have been crunched and every $1 invested in a tree returns an estimated up to $3 in benefits. So really it's a good uh, economic move as well. And I'm really, really pleased to report um, that based on uh, based on the message that we really get uh, put forth as nature being really important, um, not only for our personal health, but also planetary health, that park prescriptions were named as essentially the only Canadian uh, case study in the COP26 recent special report on climate change and health as a way to inspire people to uh, protect and restore nature as the foundation for healthy lives and livelihoods. So as you can see in that little highlighted area near the bottom there, um, prescribing nature in Canada or PARX was specifically mentioned in this COP26 report. And so if you're interested in our program, I would really encourage you to head to parkprescriptions.ca. I'm going to talk about our nature prescribing program a little bit more now. And it's a really, it's not a difficult website to get through. It's pretty concise. It's very practical and it's very visually appealing and easy to read through. So I'd encourage you to take a look. We have monthly blogs um, where we often will interview kind of key thought leaders and movers and shakers in the nature and health um, realm to just to share and inspire our audience and also lots of news and practical tips. So take a look. So if you're a healthcare professional, any licensed healthcare professional can actually register um, to prescribe nature through our program. And as I mentioned last month, we actually hit the 1000 prescriber mark, which is pretty incredible. Just for context, the major national um, nature prescription program in the US took three years to get to 1000 and they have you know, way, way more, way, a way higher population than we do. So I think we're doing pretty well. So when you register, um, you'll, if you're a healthcare professional, you will get a, a customized nature prescription file, which you can see on the left hand side there, with our standardized recommendation for outdoor time at the top, and then a space where you can work with your, um, with your patient or your client to come up with an outdoor plan that makes sense for them. And the interesting thing is it doesn't necessarily have to involve activity, although activity is really, really good for health. As we know, it could be something as simple if your client has mobility issues as sitting outside more or as their family member um, wheeling them outside to spend time in nature when they visit. So anyway, it's really customizable and we encourage um, prescribers to think about their, their clients' um, uh, capabilities and what they prefer. On the right hand side, you can see one of the different 14 fact sheets that we have broken down by different health condition um, that speak to the evidence behind how good connecting to nature is for each health condition and also some, some tips, um, which will hopefully serve to motivate people to, to get outside more and give them some practical advice on how to do that. I just want to give a brief nod to another program of the BC Parks Foundation, and it's called Healthy by Nature. And really, with prescriptions, we're really focusing on healthcare providers to get them to motivate their patients. But this is more of, more of a community-based initiative. So what Healthy by Nature does is it, it's another initiative of the BC Parks Foundation, and it connects people to nature through events and experiences and resources designed to make it easier to get outside and unplugged. So as you can see, um, there's a picture. The bottom picture there is from one of our uh, first, first day hikes. It was actually a Lunar New Year hike that we ran pre-pandemic, obviously, um, in 2019, where we brought a whole bunch of, um, of Chinese elders from that we gathered through Mosaic BC up to the top of Mount Seymour for, for some time in the snow. And it was just an amazing experience. Some of them had never, ever been up there, and they all loved it. Um, so Healthy by Nature also works with groups facing barriers to experiencing BC parks and nature through outdoor activities and excursions like, like, the, um, like these elders. And since 2019, participants have spent more than 1900 hours together in nature. And we work with a number of different partners to connect different populations um, who, who face barriers to nature. And then finally, I just want to mention what an astounding amount of media coverage we've had since we launched in November. We, there are dozens of newspaper articles, TV spots, radio interviews um, that our team across the country uh, in all the provinces where we've launched have participated in. And I think the momentum is growing and growing. And, and this is a concept I think that really speaks to how people have 
have not only connected to nature during the pandemic, but, but again, that intuitive sense we had even before the pandemic that nature was good for us. So I'd, I'd encourage you to, again, stop by our website or listen, listen on the radio or read, uh, watch TV and maybe you'll see us come, come on um, sometime soon. But uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for listening and I'm excited to see where we're gonna go. Amazing. Thank you, Dr. Lem, uh, for that for that overview. Um, I think you've given us all a lot to think about. And I just wanted to clarify for anybody who uh, was trying to send chats uh, to, to me during um, uh, and questions to me uh, during Melissa's talk. Um, I apologize, I can't receive them, but Ariel can, uh, Ariel at the Active Aging Society can, so send them his way. He'll make sure they arrive to me in time for the Q&A. Anna, I'm going to pass it over to you to share your screen and, and take us through uh, some of what you have to share. Cool. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. <clears throat> okay, can you guys see full screen right now? Yep, perfect. Okay, great. Hey, everyone. So I get to talk to you more specifically about nature prescribing and older adult populations, which I'm really excited about. Um, so just a little bit more about me. Hi, I'm Anna. I'm really excited to be here. Sarah gave a wonderful introduction, but I'm a social worker. And yeah, typically my experience has, has been with older adults work with dementia and I work in long-term care. And most of my research is in long-term care and aging. So I'm really excited to be here and get to talk to you guys and hopefully learn something from you later on. Um, and so I joined PARX actually pretty recently. It was over the summer when I moved back to Manitoba. I've been living in Ontario for school. Um, pandemic was actually really hard on me too. Uh, most things went virtual and I'm an outgoing social person and to have to spend most of my time alone behind a computer, I found it really difficult. So when I moved back home, I kind of reached out to Dr. Lem and was like, I want to bring this program to Manitoba. So beautiful here, being outside and getting to spend my summer in the white shell has been huge for me. And I want other people to experience this. And I think the healthcare community would really value nature prescription here. So it's been an incredible experience being part of PARX. And yeah, I'm so excited to get to do these presentations and talk about it more. So let's talk about nature prescribing and older adults. So I'm going to take you down to a very narrow population, narrow but exciting population and one I love to work with. And so I think there's lots of benefits for both adults, older adults, and Melissa mentioned some for children as well, but today let's talk about older adults. So this is overall some of the reasons why I think it's beneficial for this population. And what I'm gonna do after this is I'm gonna take you through a few studies, sort of like Melissa did, some of my more favorite ones, um, just to talk to you about things more specifically. But if any of these things in particular interest you, and I didn't really go into details on them, you can email me, we can provide my contact info at the end. All of it is on the PARX website, but I'm happy to share resources or informations or studies related to more of these. So, why should someone like a licensed healthcare provider prescribe nature to older adults? Can help control your blood pressure, increases someone's happiness, connects you to others. I think that's really important. Social isolation can be a huge issue uh, for some older adults still at home um, or in the community. We know social isolation is an issue, so I think this is really important. Um, reduces your risk of chronic disease, keeps your mind sharp, uh, increases your life expectancy, and can reduce your risk of chronic respiratory diseases. So let's talk about happiness first. 
I think this is important in any population, but I wanted to talk about it because I think it's interesting. And the study that I'm going to link us to, there's actually two. And so they were both done for the Nature Conservancy of Canada. And one, the first one was conducted in 2010. So this is a while ago. And back then, nine in 10 Canadian adults said that when they're connected to nature, they feel happier. And then I think, so this survey also found that 85% of Canadians indicated they were worried that natural areas will not be here for their children and grandchildren. And yeah, so this was back in 2010. So that's really telling to me, and especially what's going on right now, we're in a climate crisis, we're still in a climate crisis, and this isn't the first time we're hearing about this. So now jump to the pandemic. They did a similar survey, and again, nine out of 10 Canadians say they value nature more than ever before. 94% of Canadians indicated that spending time in nature has helped to relieve the stress and anxiety of the second wave of the pandemic, uh, with more than 85% believing nature to be important to maintaining their mental health. So we like nature. I think it makes us feel good. We knew that a while ago, we know it now, and especially with COVID when we need to be outside, and we know uh, the climate cl crisis is real. I mean, I think before maybe we weren't feeling it the same way we are now because it's actually happening in Canada. And it was before, but now we're seeing it in major cities and it's it's scary. And so this is important. So I know that took a dark turn, but I think the point that I'm trying to say is, I think we wanna be connected to nature. It makes us feel good and let's do it for the planet as well. So this was interesting to me because I work in dementia. So I, you know, that that's sort of something that I'm interested in um, and a population I like to work with. And I thought this was an interesting study. So this is about keeping your mind sharp. So this is from a longitudinal cohort study. So that means it's a study that follows a large group of people. So population from a period of time to many years later. And so it's something we do in health services research a lot to see changes over time. So this was a cohort study done in Australia and they followed over 2000 adult men and women. So who were 60 plus, these were urban dwellers. So they were living in community. And when they were first assessed, they were initially free of cognitive impairment. And so the main outcome measure, so what the scientists were looking for um, was admission to hospital or nursing home with a diagnosis of dementia. So they followed these people to see who that happened to. And along the way, they were looking for other risk factors for dementia. And so really important, of course, but what was really interesting, one of their main findings was that older adults who garden reduce their risk of dementia by 36%. And this was actually even more than walking every day, uh, particularly for women. Um, I think that's really interesting. I actually did a review a long time ago of community gardening in older adult populations, which I think is so cool just in reducing social isolation, other things for your mobility, but it's really cool. This is like a great uh, way we're seeing nature prescribing or things you could do as a nature prescription gardening, and it can reduce your risk of dementia. So I think this was a really cool study. That's why I included it. Um, so the authors suggest that while gardening may be a protective measure, so as in protects you from dementia, potentially, it should also be something we consider using as a leisure activity to promote older adult mental health in general. So they suggest not only should you do it as something protective, but to continue to do it for your mental health which goes hand in hand with nature prescribing. So this is an option, of course. Um, and then another interesting finding was that impaired respiratory function is also a strong and consistent predictor of dementia. So as we know, 
Um, nature prescribing, actually one of the benefits is it can reduce your risk of chronic respiratory diseases. So being outside is important, connecting to nature is important. And I think this study tells us a lot about that. Okay, this was another cool study um, about increased life expectancy. So the authors or the scientists, they wanted to study the association between public green spaces and longevity. So like lifespan of urban dwelling senior citizens. So these were senior citizens still living at home in sort of mega city, it was Tokyo. Um, again, it's a longitudinal cohort study. So they were able to study people over a long period of time. And so this one was over 3,000 adults, huge um, cohort. Um, and they were initially followed, so from 1992 to 1997. And they did this by having them answer a survey in 1992 and then another one in 1997. And so they found that older adults who reside closer to walkable green spaces live longer no matter what your age, general health, or income is. So basically they can controlled for sociodemographic factors, um, which is good because this means that, you know, it, it didn't really matter your income. It can still help you to live longer. So I thought this was really cool. Um, and, you know, then they suggest greenery filled public areas that are nearby and easy to walk in should be further emphasized in urban planning for the development and redevelopment of densely populated areas in a mega city. So not only do I think this is a cool study, but I actually think it's important and something a good lesson. But, you know, for folks that live downtown in high rises, so maybe low income housing. They might not have access to this the same way someone living in a community like a house may. So I think what they're trying to say is we should think about this when we plan our cities. And if you have older adults living in an institutional setting, um, you know, high rises, where is their access to nature going to be? Um, where are the walkable green spaces or the parks? And I know for me, I live in Winnipeg, in downtown Winnipeg, there's not a lot of this. So for an older adult living in a high rise in downtown Winnipeg, they're not gonna have access to this in the same way that someone living in River Heights, which is a neighborhood uh, just outside of downtown would. So something we need to think about. All right. So just a quick case study. I wanna just tell you a quick story. Normally I do this with people, but um, I just wanted to give you an example of how to prescribe nature for someone. So Janice is an 81 year old retired teacher who has an extended post-op stay after a hemicolectomy. So that's a surgery where you remove part of your colon um, and has been discharged back to her nursing home the nurse in charge reports that she has been walking, waking more often at night confused, more agitated during the day since she returned home. She gets daily visits from her son in the evenings who will typically sit with her in her room and watch television together as they chat. So what's important about nature prescribing and when you talk to your clinician about it is um, as a clinician, I should be talking to my patient about what a connection to nature looks like for them. So for me, it might, it's likely like a hike or a walk, but for someone else, it might be sitting on a park bench. And in this case, I'm trying to think of ways that Janice can connect to nature. She lives in a nurse, nursing home. And um, if she's a bit confused, she's post-surgery, I might be concerned about falls, but she has the opportunity to meet with her son in the evenings and they typically spend time chatting while watching TV. So I actually did this case study with a group of nurses just a week ago and we talked about different ways we could prescribe nature. First off, it would be a conversation with Janice and her son. Um, you know, it wouldn't just be my idea, but perhaps in the summer months when it's not too hot outside um, or not too cold, instead of sitting in front of the TV, 
Janice and her son could sit outside on the park bench or on a bench. Hopefully this nursing home is close to some nature, maybe a tree, um, and they could have their conversation there. But then a nurse mentioned too that there's a lot of VR now that's been introduced in nursing homes or um, you know, you can go on YouTube and find like a nature scene. So if they needed to be inside, perhaps there's like um, a virtual way of connecting her to nature while they have their chats. So maybe through VR on YouTube, or maybe there's a television program that has a big emphasis on nature. So you can be creative here. And maybe when Janice is feeling better, she can do some walking outside with her son. But I think most importantly, it's got to be a conversation with Janice and maybe her son. Um, okay. Okay. So, are we are we at the end? You've got a couple more minutes. Okay, great. Yeah, go okay, for I'm it. I'm actually almost done. Okay, uh, take your time. Okay, so I just. Melissa has already directed you guys to the website, but I, I will say as well, it is very user friendly. It's great. It's full of resources. Um, so there's actually a whole PDF that's dedicated to older adult health, which is where I got a lot of the information I just provided you with. Um, but go to it. It's not just a prescriber that can look at this. You can look at it as well. Um, so I just want to end off talking a bit about climate change and older adult health, because we talked about nature prescribing and how it can be beneficial for you um, and older adults in the community. But, you know, given what's going on right now, I think it's important we address the climate crisis and talk a bit about climate change and just hit home some of the concerns I have for this population, why I think this type of work is important. So unfortunately now, everyone will be affected by climate change at some point in their lives. Um, however, there are various reasons that why for some folks, they might be more affected and the impact might be greater. And so older adults, and the reason this is because it could be because of income, where you live, um, your health. And so for older adults, they can be more vulnerable to the risks of climate change because just normal changes in the body associated with aging that can impact our mobility. Um, we're more likely to experience chronic health conditions at an older age, uh, and we experience weakened or depreciated immune systems at older age. So the impacts that we need to worry about, um, I've listed a few, but extreme heat for sure. So higher temperatures have been linked to increases in hospital admissions, illness, and death, um, particularly for older adults with congestive heart failure, diabetes, or other chronic health conditions. Poor air quality um, worsens respiratory conditions, which can be common in older adults. So COPD or asthma, air pollution increases our risk of heart attack. Um, and you know, changing weather patterns and wildfires. And I know you guys have experienced wildfires in BC. I've experienced them in the prairies um, recently this summer. It was really bad out here. Um, and this raises the amount of pollution, dust, smoke in the air, which of course is very hard for folks with COPD or asthma. Um, then I want to think about extreme weather events, and I know this hits close to home, but older adults are actually more likely to suffer from storm and flood related fatalities. This could be because of mobility where you live, if you lived in an institutional setting, um, because extreme weather requires evacuation. And if mobility is a challenge, um, this could be really hard on the older adult population. So I typically work in long-term care and I think about that all the time. How would you evacuate a group of older adults, some with dementia from long-term care setting, but same goes for folks who may live in a high rise. So this is a huge problem. Even if you live at home and mobility might be an issue for you in extreme weather events, 
this is scary. Um, yeah. And of course, like a power outage can affect any medical equipment. And then lastly, I'm almost there. Uh, so vector borne diseases, um, that's like uh, something from ticks or mosquitoes. So West Nile, Lyme disease um, and contaminated water. And I think really the message is that for someone with a depreciated immune system, any of these are gonna impact you more. So I just think that this is something we need to care about. And I know Melissa's already said this, but let's reconnect with nature and let's protect it better. The time is now. And then I guess I'll just let Melissa end off with calls to action and then Sarah's gonna take over. Thanks. So if you're feeling inspired after our talk, these are just a few things that you can do. So the first one is spend at least two hours in nature each week and at least 20 minutes each time, um, like we recommend in our program for optimal mental and physical health. Also spread the word to your doctor and other health professionals about PARX. Any, again, any licensed healthcare professional can prescribe. So the more who are clued into our message and the more who are connecting their clients and patients to nature, the healthier we will all be. And also something that we're doing right now with the BC Park Foundation is trying to reduce those barriers to nature connection. So we're looking for community partners who know either nature-based event organizations or venues to see if they're willing to, for example, provide people who have been prescribed nature with discounts to admission um, or even free passes, for example. Um, there's some uh, exciting announcements coming out in the new year about different uh, partners, including both national partners and local partners we're, we're going to be working with. So if any of you know anyone who would be willing to extend something like that, let us know. And then finally, donate. So a lot of the, re the work that we do, I know the work Anna does, the work that I do, it's a lot of volunteer work, to be honest. And I mean, it's wonderful. This is like, I think, like my life's uh, work is to connect people to nature, but it does require staff. It does re require funds. So if you feel moved to donate, please donate to the BC Parks Foundation um, or the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Um, and I'm just going to pop in. Thank you both so much. Um, uh, for your time and your wisdom. I'm just going to pop into the chat uh, a blog uh, by some of our colleagues at the Active Aging Research Team. Benches are like porches. Anna, it really uh, connects to your uh, some of the ideas you were sharing around how to connect to nature uh, when you're living in an urban setting and, um, and, and just the benefits of, of getting, uh, getting outside when you can. And I know a number of our Choose to Move participants on the call today uh, have chosen gardening as part of some of their activities uh, to keep them active and, and socially connected. So um, great to see some of the evidence around there. And thank you for calling out uh, some of the health um, uh, concerns that, that uh, older adults should keep in mind and consult their GPs with. And, and I hope everybody considers talking to their GP on how they can get a prescription for nature and, and keep active and um, in green space. We don't have very much time for questions. We will answer a couple of them uh, in our follow-up email for the ones that we weren't able to get to. Um, but I did wanna pose um, either to, to you, Dr. Lam, or to Anna. Um, there, there was one question that came in around, do you have any suggestions uh, for nature-based experience uh, experiences for people who are maybe facing some barriers to getting outside, mobility barriers? Um, when getting outside every day or, or maybe every week isn't always feasible. Do you have any workarounds for them? Yeah, I, and I think Anna mentioned this in her presentation. There are so many different creative ways that we can bring nature to people who have trouble getting to nature. So one thing I want to say first is there's this, this 33300 principle in terms of trees. And it's this kind of growing international trend to make sure that everyone who lives anywhere can see at least three trees from their window. Um, and uh, there's at least 30% tree cover in their cities and they're no further than 300 meters from a park. So I think just being able to look outside of our windows, there is research showing there are some significant positive health benefits just from seeing it. But we can do other things like bring house plants into, into people's rooms. Um, we can, even nature sounds, there's research showing that just playing birdsong can improve mental health outcomes. Um, I was speaking with some 
different physicians who work in hospitals about like Anna mentioned the virtual reality stuff, like kind of giving inpatients those those experiences through looking through a headset and, and listening at the same time. So we just need to be creative. And then one more thing I want to emphasize is that nature is what you make of it in many ways. So in some of the studies that we cited, um, they, they asked people to kind of spend time in nature in a self-defined way. They didn't say you have to be in the backwoods, you have to be on the side of a mountain. They just said, spend somewhere where you feel like you've had a meaningful experience in nature. And so if we can change our concepts of what nature is, um, realizing that we can find it possibly in a plant on our windowsill, we can find it in a community garden, we can find it in a corner park, that, then we can really reap those health benefits. Fantastic. And any, I, I mean, many of these uh, suggestions that you've just provided would apply for the winter setting, but any specific um, uh, suggestions for, you know, the many Canadians and, and British Columbians who, if Columbians who are about to embark on, on winter? Especially, and take I, that one? And, and I will also say there were a few questions too around um, folks who are maybe experiencing uh, some concerns about falls and falls risks. So any suggestions? Yeah, so I think it's, you know, Melissa just listed a whole bunch. And I think that it, it's all about being creative. So for some people, it's going to be different than others. But I would suggest like it falls. That was like Janice, the case study I said. I was worried about her in falls. So I would prefer that she's possibly sitting down somewhere. So I, I really like the nature sounds. I actually list them all the time. So that's a really great one. Even when you're just walking around the house or doing chores, anything, I think that's great. Um, but there's so many ways we can access it now. Like I said, YouTube. You can find so many clips on YouTube now, just like, you know, how you, there's that fireplace, mm -hmm. you can find like a forest scene. Um, and I used to too, I try when I worked with older adults, um, I try to bring in plants into their room. Um, and that works for me too. <laughs> well, wonderful. I am, um, we're, we're at, at about uh, two minutes to two. And uh, I think this is probably a good time uh, to close off. Um, I want to uh, offer a huge um, thank you to, to Dr. Lem and, and Anna Cooper-Reed for, for your time uh, and, and for everybody who joined our call today. Um, please, uh, you know, consider or con continue uh, supporting the work to keep uh, people in your life uh, healthy and, um, and, and think about those ways that you can promote the health of, of our planet and, and the nature around us. Um, you will have seen a, a suggestion to, to donate, donate to the Prescription for Nature um, uh, program. I'm also throwing up in the chat uh, the Active Aging Society's uh, donate button. Consider uh, sending community uh, seniors uh, to, to choose to move uh, through, through that link. Um, and stay connected with us through our uh, social media channels. You can find us uh, at theactiveagingsociety.org. Um, and, uh, and the active aging research team links uh, provided earlier. Uh, we look forward to connecting with all of you at an upcoming webinar in, in 2022. Thank you again for your time and uh, we'll see you soon.